All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we're talking about how to use Hyper Backup to back up your Synology NAS to Backblaze's B2 architecture. And so this is a really good, really well-priced offsite backup for your Synology NAS, and Hyper Backup has some advantages over using CloudSync. All right, so before I really start this tutorial, I really wanna talk about the difference between CloudSync and Hyper Backup. So CloudSync is used for syncing files. Basically, its goal is to have a folder on your NAS and anything that changes on that folder, it wants to make sure another folder on Backblaze would basically mirror. And so this is good in some ways and bad in others. For one, it allows you to access your files, basically anywhere in the world. Through Backblaze's website, you can just go in and download any one of your files anywhere in the world, and it's really easy for that. And if you need to, you can even say, oh, ship me a hard drive with all of these things on it. It is really nice for that, but it is not a true backup. Basically, it's not designed as a whole backup suite, it is designed as a clone. Hyper Backup works a little differently. Hyper Backup uses its proprietary format to the .hbk file, which means you can't just browse it using a website, you instead would need to link a Synology NAS or a Synology application to it to even be able to start accessing any of the files to it. But what it does, it allows compression, deduplication, and a ton of other features like that, as well as really managing it as a backup. So it is designed to be able to allow you to restore any file from any time, basically all through Hyper Backup, depending on how much versions you keep. It is really nice for that and it works really well. The one downside is you can't access it anywhere in the world. You would instead need to hook up your computer or your NAS to this Hyper Backup bucket and basically use that as an interface to be able to get your files it still would work and you still could get everything up and running, but it's not gonna be as clean. You can't just go through on Backblaze's site and say, I want this file, this file, this file, and this file, and download them like that. It is much more complicated, but for a backup, it's perfect. Because in a backup situation where your main NAS completely goes down, well, it's really nice to be able to make sure you can recover everything, and spending an hour getting everything up and running first is not that big of a deal. Plus, if you wanted to, you could actually have Backblaze send you the entire backup on a hard drive and be able to use it locally like that and get way better performance out of it. Remember, this is for a offsite backup of, oh no, everything's on fire, we really need to get it back, and maybe restoring in a week or so is not that big of a deal for you because it's a very low chance that this happens. It's really up to how your use cases are, but I'd say if this is your, oh no, everything's on fire, I need to make sure I can recover a backup, I would recommend using Hyper Backup over CloudSync because CloudSync is not perfect. It's had a few glitches and you don't have old versions, which are a really great feature of Hyper Backup. All right, and so the first thing you're gonna need is a Backblaze account. And I've got an affiliate link in the description for that. And so once you've got a Backblaze account, you're gonna be able to come to this B2 cloud storage bucket. And as you can see, I've got this one here. Well, you can't see because it's blurred out. But it's basically a cloud sync of my most important files that I might need to access remotely. And so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna click create a bucket. We're gonna have to give it a unique name. Basically, you just need a unique name for this, and we're gonna make sure that the files are private. Basically, if you wanted them public, you could actually use this to host images on your website, but we don't want your hyper backup being released on the internet. And for object lock, we are going to disable it because we don't wanna cause any issues with hyper backup. And it wants dashes instead of underscores. All right, and so just like that, we've got our bucket set up. All right, so first off, let's do one thing in lifecycle settings. So right now, we've got keep all versions of the file, which is going to cause a lot of storage over time, but we don't want the file deleted immediately. This is because we wanna make sure that worst case, if your NAS got cryptoed or hacked into, that if it decided to delete your entire offsite backup, that it would not be deleted immediately. Instead, what we can do is we're going to keep prior versions of the files for 30 days. That way you have 30 days to recover all of your data, assuming somebody malicious went through and on your account said, oh, let's delete his backups before cryptoing this NAS, so that way he is more likely to pay me. This way, Hyper Backup will think, oh, it's been deleted, but in reality, it will be there for another 30 days, so you would be able to go back to that and restore from it. Plus, Hyper Backup's not gonna change that much from a file sense, so it's not that big of a delta. So it's not like this is going to be 
carrying around a ton of data and costing you more money, it's really only going to cost you a little bit and the time that it is going to cost you a ton more, which would be when they deleted your entire offsite backup, is when you're gonna want it. So I would really recommend having this 30, maybe seven days if you check a lot, but having that as peace of mind is a really nice thing. And we're going to update the bucket. It'll take a few minutes, but that's not a big deal for us. All right, and so now we're done with that. So let's go ahead and create an app key. All right, and so now we've got different types of app keys. Basically, these are keys that you can use with Synology to interface, and you've got a master one. You do not want to use your master one with the Synology. Instead, we're going to want to create a new application key. And so to do that, you just click New Application Key, and we're going to call it Tutorial Key. And we're going to say it only has access to this one bucket. That's really important because you don't want one key being able to break into a bunch of other things. Setting the security up when you start off is not that difficult and can really save your butt down the line. And I would highly recommend doing that. You just want to start by restricting as much as possible. For access, you're going to need to read and write. And we're going to want to make sure to allow listing of all bucket names because we're going to be using the S3 protocol and we don't want to have any issues. Honestly, there's a very low likely chance that this key being able to know what buckets exist is going to harm you. But if for some reason that happened, maybe you don't have that. And then under here, file name prefix, we don't need to touch it. And then if you want an extra security, you could set a duration on it, but it's your backup. You want to be able to set it and forget it. So I would not recommend creating a time of living. And so now we just click create key. So now we've got this application key. Basically key ID will stay here a while, but the application key will not. So we're gonna go ahead and actually just copy this whole thing and we're gonna paste it in a text document. That way we've got it later on. All right, and so now we are all set up for that. Let's go back into DSM. So now that we've got those keys, we can go ahead and get our hyper backup started. If you don't have hyper backup, it's really easy, just download it from the package center. And now we're going to go into hyper backup and we're gonna select create new one. And it's going to be a data backup. And now we're gonna go down and we're going to go down until we see S3 storage. This is generally used for AWS's S3, but Backblaze's B2 actually uses the exact same S3 protocol. So we can just select that. Click next. And so now we're just gonna be able to set this up. For S3 server, we're going to select custom server URL. And to get that, we're going to go back to Backblaze and go to our bucket. And we're going to copy this right here, which is the endpoint. And for signature version, we're gonna go V4. And now we need the access key and the secret key. So the key ID is the access key. And the secret key is the application key. And now we're gonna do the tick mark for the bucket name. And we can see right here, it was successful. Space Rex Hyper Backup Tutorial. And now we can just leave it as this directory because it's just gonna create its own. You could also say, if this was your main NAS, call it NAS1, and that way you know which hyper backup is which. And so now we're just gonna go ahead and click next. Now it's just regular hyper backup. Let's select the folders we'd like to do. I'm gonna do general and homes. Then the important one we do probably want to back up is Synology Drive Server. Having that backed up is a really good thing because it's got all your configurations and old versions and things like that. And so you can also do any other packages there as well. And now we'll give it a, a task name. We'll, we'll definitely want task notifications. I would really recommend compressing the data. There's really no reason not to. It's not that CPU intensive for you and it can really save you some money down the line. Transport encryption is going to be good. Honestly, you're sending it over the internet, so you're definitely going to want to encrypt it. And then you just set up your backup schedule. So this is basically saying every day at 740, we do a backup. That works for me. And then there's also an integrity schedule. You can choose how often to run your integrity schedule. Then for multi-part upload size, if you've got really fast internet, 
the larger is going to be better. But if you've got really slow internet, it can be better to go smaller files. It really depends basically if there's likelihood of a dropout. 512 should work fine, but you might also do like 128. Honestly, it's not that big of a deal, but if you do see some performance issues, then you might want to change this. And now for client side encryption, we're definitely going to want to enable that. And we're going to have to create a password. And so this password is really important. There's a password and it's going to generate a key for us. If you don't have at least one of those two things, your backup is entirely useless. So honestly, make it a basic password. Just make sure it's a password that you can get to. Write it down on a piece of paper somewhere. Honestly, the likelihood of somebody being able to access your API and also happen to have your password is pretty low. If you're really, really, really concerned about security, maybe you don't. But remember, if you lose this password, it's completely useless. So I would really recommend making sure that there's a way to get this password, no matter what happens. Hey, tell it to your friends and family if you trust them. But having more and more people know it, the better. If you're okay with that security. For me, personally, a lot of the time, I would much rather risk somebody getting access to my data, especially when there's a very low chance, than risk losing my data. But depending on what your data is, you might have a different view on life. And so now we're just gonna go ahead and click next. It's gonna tell us about what I just told you about the passwords, and it's going to download a file for us, most likely. And that's going to be the key file. And then for backup rotation, this is to keep your B2 from getting absolutely huge. So I would do a smart recycle. I really like smart recycle. Basically goes through and keeps a certain number of versions of all of your files. And so that's really helpful to have. You can also set up your own custom retention if you want to. One thing to remember, this could start getting expensive because you're keeping all your data from the past four years. So you can start selecting however you want it to work because you're going to be paying for this data through B2. And so now it wants to download that encryption key, so we're gonna say allow. And so it just downloaded that encryption key for us. And so that's another thing. You can also, if you forget the password, use the encryption key, and it's just like a password. So that's also great for something like employees where you want them to be able to access this, but you don't want them to have the password. So you should treat it just like the password in some senses, but maybe it's a password you use on other things. Then maybe you don't give them the password, but instead the encryption key. All right, and so now we just click backup now. All right, and so now it's finally done backing it up. So now we can go ahead and test this out. Let's just say, okay, I delete a file in FileStation that was backed up on there. Let's say I go into my home folder, my general folder, and let's just remove this. That was from my uh, Plex demonstration. This is not unfortunately taken. And we'll just go ahead and delete it. So now say we wanna get it back. So now we can go in and go into the restore portal right here, and we'll say it's a data one, and select it. Now we've gotta enter the password or that encryption key and it is going to be a little bit slower than a local configuration. There's a lot of communication that it's gotta go back and forth, and I'm currently running this on a virtual machine, so it's, it's slow. And so we can choose, okay, we don't wanna restore the system configuration. That would just be a true backup if we needed to, or a true restore. And so now we need to choose what to restore. And we can just completely restore general, or what we could also do is go back and select a single file using browse backup. But we can restore it completely here. And this is great for if something got completely corrupted or anything like that. Though note, everything will be overwritten with this. And so now we'd be able to basically do a full restore and we can go ahead and try that now. All right, and so just like that, it's totally restored the file. Another thing you could have done is gone through browse backups right here. It is gonna be a little bit slow. And we could have just clicked it right here and selected the single file and clicked restore. So that's good for a one file restore, whereas what we did was a total rebuild. And so if we go in now, we go back into general, and we can see that the folder is exactly how we left it, 
during that backup. And really that's all there is to it. It just works now in the background it is going to do everything for you and it's going to be great if there's a critical failure and all of a sudden you need to rebuild everything. It's gonna be really good for that, though it is gonna be a little bit slow. Though with Synology DSM, you can also recover single point files very easily. So that's how you set up Hyper Backup with Backblaze B2 to get a really great offsite backup of your Synology NAS automatically on the B2 architecture. All right, well that's gonna be it for this tutorial. Go ahead and leave any of the tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below. And if you wanna hire me, I've got a link for that as well. All right, have a good one, bye.